global fishing capacity could catch the world catch four times over. The world's long-lining industry sets 1.4 billion hooks every year. These are estimated to be set on enough line to encircle the globe more than 550 times. The mouth of the largest trawling net in the world is big enough to accommodate 13 747s. We are fighting a war against fish, right? And we are throwing at them our industry, and we are winning. And that's how we perceive our interaction with them. It's a fight. Hello and welcome. Could you imagine a world without fish? That's the question being asked by a hard-hitting documentary called The End of the Line. The film explains the catastrophic consequences of overfishing and all the important signs from the ocean we've been ignoring. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says that around 80% of wild marine fish are now either fully exploited or overfished, and the most popular varieties are at risk for extinction within a few decades. Fishing quotas are often ignored completely, and in some parts of the world, the ocean stocks are totally depleted. So who's to blame? Is it the fish industry or the demanding consumers? On today's show, we take a look at the state of the world's seas and ask, when it comes to the wealth in our oceans, are we at the end of the line? Remember, you can join our conversation with your comments. Log on to livestation.com forward slash AJE, enter the chat room and take part. I'm joined now by the author and director of the documentary, The End of the Line, from London. Charles Clover is an award-winning journalist who focuses on environmental issues and previously co-authored a book on organic agriculture with Britain's Prince Charles. Charles Clover first published The End of the Line in 2004. Also in London is film director Rupert Murray, who turned the book into a feature-length documentary, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Charles, starting with you, uh, for some people, there may be some awareness that there's an issue with, uh, with world fish stocks depleting, but for most people, it's, it's not an issue on the daily public radar. What, what drew your attention to it in the first place? Well, I'm a, I'm a recreational fisherman. I'm, I'm a fly fisherman since childhood. And I started seeing uh, the salmon not returning to the rivers in the 80s. And I began to look further afield for the reason for that. And I began to look in the sea. And I began to question whether pollution was really the problem in the sea or whether it was just us, you know, catching lots of fish. And then I came across uh, a, a presentation in about 1990 about the effects on the seabed and the creatures who live there of trawling which uh, they used to say was the equivalent of uh, plowing a field seven times in one year in the places in the North Sea where it is done most. And uh, it struck me as a farmer's son that not much would survive that process and that the sea must be under the most enormous pressure if that's what we mm -hmm. were doing to it. And that set me off on finding out what else was happening to our oceans now, on and what has mm. uh, on that front uh, what on I have front, found out has uh, go ahead. I was going to ask you on that front what, sh what shocked you the most because of yeah. course as a, any good journalist you did your research and you went out to find the information what shocked you the most uh, when it came down to that uh, information that you collected for your 2004 book The End of the Line I think what shocked me the most was as you've said yourself that no one was telling you this everyone is telling you that global warming is a great problem Everybody is telling you that food security is a great problem uh, in the next 50 years. What nobody is telling you is that the oceans are a great problem almost more immediately than that and are linked to both global warming uh, and food security. And that is actually what, even in the process of researching this film, has blown our minds because the, the, uh, the ocean is essential to, to, to trapping carbon dioxide and a healthy ocean requires there to be healthy populations of fish, which mm -hmm. we haven't got. Rupert Murray, uh, what surprised and perhaps uh, shocked you, I guess? I wonder, the film does um, predict uh, the end of the fish stocks significantly globally, uh, perhaps within, well, certainly within our lifetime, perhaps, you know, around the 20, sort of 50 mark. Um, how can you sort of be sure of these kind of figures? How can you make sure that you're not making people think you're sensationalizing with this kind of information? Well, uh, that finding, the 2048 finding, comes from a, a paper of about 25 uh, uh, ocean ecologists, marine biologists, who were actually looking at other issues, and this is a sort of byproduct of, of, their, of their findings. 
Um, they, 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 what they're saying is that essentially if, if things remain the same, uh, then the, 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 the fish stocks, that we, the fish that we currently now eat, will be depleted by 90% or more by around by 2048. Now, um, things can change. Hopefully things will change for the better, and that won't happen. In some places, uh, the fish might run out sooner. We went to uh, Cornwall, the southwest of England, and they had some species projected to disappear by as early as 2018. In other places, the, uh, they're doing quite well, and maybe the, the trajectory is longer. But what, what's generally happening is that the general trend is that fish over the, uh, uh, throughout the entire world's oceans are being taken out much faster than they can replenish. Uh, it's a finite resource. Uh, one day, we will run out. Uh, the 2048 uh, date is a hook. Uh, uh, around which you can hang an idea, the idea that the oceans uh, will run out of fish at some point in time. Of course, how you get the message across is important. We had a, a comment from our Facebook viewers, uh, one of them, Chris, uh, wrote in saying the film is indicative of current society to educate us about inequality by turning a documentary into a reality TV show. I guess uh, some people will, are going to be inevitably skeptical about uh, what they see and, and you know constantly being bombarded with environmental messages such as this. How do you convince people? How do you convince them this is something they should pay attention to? Well, I think that um, I, I think hopefully the documentary does convince people. I mean, the people I've spoken to, the people we've shown it to, are convinced by this. So in, in the same way that I was convinced by Charles's book, in the way that Charles was convinced by what he saw out in the, in, in, in the ports around the world, and by reading the scientific papers of incredible people who've really revolutionized the way that we, sh that we see the sea. Uh, you know, ocean science is behind, is about 15, 15 years behind climate science, as only recently we discovered that these, that, 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 that these massive global problems, that the same problems that people saw locally were happening, or happening all over the world. And, and this science really has changed the way we've seen the sea. Uh, and you only have to go to go fishing, as I used to do. I mean, I used to do it um, uh, along beaches in, in the south of England uh, to realize that the fish aren't there in anything like the same numbers that, that, that they used to be. That, that effect is hidden from consumers because as local populations are depleted, fishermen uh, go further and further afield to find the fine fish for your plate. And so you don't actually, you don't actually see the, the impacts in your local supermarket, in your local restaurant. The species may change slightly and slowly, um, uh, but, the, but the effects are not felt directly by the consumer. And that's one of the reasons why this, this issue uh, is, 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 not, is not felt by people as much as others. Well, Charles, uh, one thing that disturbed me, and I, I mean, Rupert did a grand job of putting your, uh, your information together into, into the movie. It's beautifully shot. Um, the, um, the thing that really disturbed me, I guess, was the issue of the, the, the trawling, particularly the ocean floor trawling. Uh, take us through the kind of damage it does. We, we talked a bit at the beginning with a, a clip from the film with that about you know, nets the size that would hold you know, 13 jumbo jets, basically. But take us through the kind of damage it does. Well, those enormous trawls, the Gloria trawl, the one that can take 13 747s in its mouth, are used in, 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 as midwater trawls in the middle of the, in the, middle of the sea, uh, right out in the middle of the Atlantic, for sh fish that don't shoal. So they're a slightly different kind of, uh, of, of net to the kind that is used in, on the continental shelves every day. Um, those are often much more destructive, actually, funnily enough, than these huge nets, uh, because they uh, are fishing in places that are very well fished. So the fish do their best to get away from the nets and are, and are accustomed to uh, being chased by nets. So they have uh, metal bars at the front and tickler chains. Um, so they smash up the, the bottom fauna. And uh, an estimate has been done in the North Sea that that beam trawls, as these things are called, when used for flatfish like sole and place, of which there are very few left in the North Sea for this reason, uh, they smash up 16 pounds of marine organisms for every one pound of marketable sole or place that they produce. So this is an enormously destructive activity, uh, trawling, which a lot of people in uh, areas of the world where they manage fish better than they do in Europe, um, and there are some, uh, are beginning to question whether we should do right. th this activity called trawling at all. I mean, for example, I've just been in the uh, west coast of the United States where 
uh, the, the most powerful conservation organization in the world, the Nature Conservancy, private, private uh, 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 mm. conservation organization, has bought up four million acres of, of the uh, seabed, uh, banned trawling on it, and sold the permits back to the fishermen as long as they use hooks. Right. Now, I think that is the kind of thing we are going to have to do if we are going to have sustainable stocks of fish for the future. Well, you know, and, uh, you know in, in many countries of the world, we're nowhere near doing that. Right. Well, of course, the film devotes quite a, a, um, a lot of attention to some of the key issues that have come up, such as the bluefin tuna, which, uh, which is very much a threatened uh, species. Here's a short clip from the film looking at bluefin tuna. The bluefin is one of the most iconic fish in the sea. Its beautiful hydrodynamic shape and specially heated blood allow it to accelerate faster than a supercar. Pound for pound, its delicious flesh is the most expensive and sought after on the planet. The bluefin once sustained Roman legions in battle. Now it feeds fashion-conscious diners and sushi restaurants around the world. Well, the bluefin uh, tuna is in pretty bad shape, Rupert. What uh, I mean, what's brought this particular species to such a mess, uh, messy situation? Um, a, a massive amount of fishing. Uh, the bluefin has been has been fished for its meat um, all over the world for 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 for, for many well, hundreds of years in the Mediterranean. And we went to a uh, a, a fishery, a traditional fishery called the Almadraba, it's known as a Matanza in Italian, uh, and they, ha they have records of that fishery going back uh, 3,000 years. So this is a fish that, that has sustained people for, you know, for a very long time. But what's happened recently is that um, the, in the industrialized fishing, fishing fleet has geared up and has targeted this, fi this fish. Uh, it's, it's amazing that it's actually hung on so long. But uh, but huge, but way too many uh, uh, the, uh, fish are being taken out of the out of the out of the stock, out of the population. The the percentage that the uh, that the fishing for the industrial fishing fleet takes, I think it's about a third of the entire current population every year, and uh, and the bluefin tuna is facing mm. stock collapse um, as we speak. So. There's a there's a massive problem with with ranching, it, uh, uh, the ranching the tuna, which is which is they catch the tuna alive, they put it into these cages, they fatten it up until the meat is and the fish is at the right size, and then they shoot it in the head and fly it to Japan or other areas where there are where, where there are sushi restaurants, mm -hmm. and that whole that whole market is driving this incredible fish that heats its own its own blood um, to extinction. Well, we're going to ask uh, more about that in a moment. We're going to take a short break here. Uh, as we get back, we'll have more of our discussion on the world's fishing industry. Uh, as we pause, let me remind you, you can join the conversation with your comments. Log on to livestation.com. We'll be right back. <laughs> 